Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on First and Second Peter, entitled Feed My Sheep, First and Second Peter. And this is lesson three in that series, entitled A Royal Priesthood. I wonder what that would be. This is the lesson for April 15 of 2017. Before we start, I'd like to ask you to join us in a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, once again we are seeking to understand better our relationship to you and all that you mean to us and what you want of us. May we not make the mistakes that your friends did so many years ago in uh, disregarding your commandments and disobeying your laws. Our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we know that way back at the foot of Mount Sinai, the children of Israel promised God three times that they would be obedient. In fact, the first time in Exodus 19 was before they even had heard what God wanted them to do. Oh, yes, whatever you say, we'll just do it. And then he, he, he quoted it to them later on in, in Exodus 24, verse 3, and then he wrote it down and he read it to them again and they said it again. Well, this is right after or within a very short time of, the, uh, of God drowning the Egyptian army in the Red Sea and Not the only, deliverance, yeah. all the plagues. Of course they're going to do what God says. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, we'll see. <laughs> so what does it mean? You know the words used there. What does it mean to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people? These, these words in various forms were used repeatedly in the Old Testament to refer to the Hebrew nations, the, and eventually the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. But uh, things weren't going so well by that time. Um, from the beginning in Abraham's day, Abraham and his descendants were supposed to represent God to all the nations around them. Abraham himself did an excellent job of that. And sometimes we, 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 forgot this, we forget this part of the story. So I, I'm going to read you a very significant passage from Ellen White. This is, of course, from Patriarchs and Prophets. It would I'm be... I'm here. Education. I'm sorry. From Education, uh, page 187, paragraph 2. There's parts of it in Patriarchs and Prophets. God, God called Abraham to be a teacher of his word. He chose him to be the father of a great nation because he saw that Abraham would instruct his children and his household in the principles of God's law. And that which gave power to Abraham's teaching was the influence of his own life. His great household consisted of more than a thousand souls, many of them heads of families and not a few, but newly converted from heathenism. So what does that tell us about what Abraham was doing in his spare time? He's being the minister and the judge. He was, he was being an evangelist, I would say. Yeah. When he wasn't a general. Yeah. Such a household required a firm hand at the helm. No weak, vacillating methods would suffice. Of Abraham, God said, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. So we need to remember children, he had very few. Household, a lot. Yet his authority was exercised with such wisdom and tenderness that hearts were one. The testimony of the divine watcher is, they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, Genesis 18, 19. And Abraham's influence extended beyond his own household. Wherever he pitched his tent, he set up beside it the altar for sacrifice and worship. When the tent was removed, the altar remained. And many a roving Canaanite, whose knowledge of God had been gained from the life of Abraham his servant, tarried at that altar to offer sacrifice to Jehovah. What do you suppose that kind of a witness, what did it look like? What? I mean, you get somebody to stop by, oh, he, there's a place where Abraham built an altar, well, I better sacrifice. Does that indicate a complete change in mind and attitude? What does that signify? Or does it mean, well, there's another God I need to pay a tribute to? Well, they're starting to respond in some way 
to in whatever de degree they can. Okay. So, well, what would that what would that be like in our day? What would the equivalent be of of leaving an altar? Would we leave a church? Well, I, I suppose that would be the closest Oedipus kind of structure that we could we could have in our day. Um, church or school, the, the Adventist denomination is famous for leaving schools, it's famous for leaving churches, it's famous for leaving medical institutions, clinics, hospitals. Would those be equivalent to Abraham's altar? While being fully acquainted with God's original plan for his people, Peter was saying that since the Jews failed in carrying out God's plan, it was time for Christians to take up that covenant relationship with God. Is that a fair suggestion? What do you think? Well, it is true that the Jews, or let's say the Israelites, failed to carry out this mission to become mm -hmm. a kingdom of priests and kings. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a concept difficult to wrap our brains around. <laughs> But that is still what the New Testament tells us to accomplish, and I'm not sure that we're getting very close to that day. But Paul said, describes something like that in these words. See what you think of this, Romans 11, 17 and 18. Some of the branches of the cultivated olive tree have been broken off, and a branch of a wild olive tree has been joined to it. You Gentiles, I think that would be all of us here, you Gentiles are like that wild olive tree, and now you share the strong spiritual life of the Jews. So then you must not despise those who are broken off like branches. How can you be proud? You're just a branch. You don't support the roots. The roots support you. So how does that apply in 2017? So the fact that Peter and Paul made this kind of analogy to the ancient uh, Jews, mm -hmm. Uh, suggests that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they came up with that. They, it's not like me going out and saying, oh, I'm like the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they came up with this. Okay. So it's valid. So, I mean, if you just walked out in the street and, and you could somehow get people to sort of understand what you're, what you're offering, and you'd say, how would you like to have a special relationship with God? How many would turn that down? If, if you don't say anything more than that, would you like to be a special privileged people of God? Depends what you think your God is. I mean, yeah. you've got a kind yeah. of an idea what your God is, mm -hmm. and you're asking the question, so how... I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, if you, did, if you walked out on the street in, in downtown Los Angeles or San Bernardino here or other major city in this, in this country, for example, and you asked them, would you like to be, have a special relationship with God? He's invited you. How would you respond? What do you, what, what do you think would happen? Well, the problem is that there are 30,000 different Christian denominations saying just that. So which one should we mm -hmm. accept as being the correct one? So Some would just say, I don't believe in God. So <laughs> yes. yeah. get away. So unfortunately, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately. I think fortunately, along with this, offer from God comes some significant responsibilities, and that's where the hang-up comes. Yes. So how well do you think we as modern-day Christians, and especially as Seventh-day Adventists, are doing at, for example, spreading the gospel to the ends of the world? You know, we, one of our famous verses, Matthew 24, 14, what are we going to do? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the ends of the world. Are we doing it? Let's notice that it is a singular gospel, mm -hmm. this gospel. Mm -hmm. The one that's always, and the good news right there is the good news about God. Well, Peter puts it in these terms, and let me uh, see if I can. Rid yourselves then of all evil, no more lying or hypocrisy or jealousy or insulting language. Be like newborn babies always thirsting for a pure for the pure spiritual milk, so that by drinking it, you may grow up and be saved. Okay? The pure spiritual milk. What would that be? Must not have been what Paul was talking about when he was talking about milk. Why not? We should be 
eating solid food. Yeah, so that's I'd that's the, that's the challenge. So, and Peter, Peter's here, you know, go up drinking this, this spiritual milk, and then Paul says in several places, um, you know, you need, to, you need to stop being children and grow up. And Matthew 18 talks about Jesus, who said, you know, unless you become like children, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. So what do, how do we put all that together? Well, they're both using the metaphor of milk, but they may not exactly be uh, applying it in the same way. Paul actually gives, uh, you know, let us not lay again the foundation of, you mm -hmm. know, uh, he lists a whole bunch of things which he seems to be implying were, uh, were milk. Yeah. And that we'll move on to the solid food now. Yeah. And then he well, there's two places where Paul really talks about that. Ephesians 4 is one of them. And the other one is Hebrews 5, the end of Hebrews 5, beginning of, he of Hebrews 6. Mm -hmm. And we may get a chance to look at those a little bit later. Well, in these verses, Peter exhorts us to avoid, and let's just think about these things, all evil, are we doing that? Lying, hypocrisy, jealousy, or insulting language. Instead of living like the world, we need to be like newborn babies, thirsting for the pure spiritual milk that we may grow through it. Now, it's interesting that it talks, it calls it the spiritual milk. You know what the word is there? The word for spiritual there is a Greek word, logike. Does that sound like? The word for spirit is pneuma. Doesn't sound anything like logike. Logic. Logical. You would think that would be directly related to logical. So, how, what does that have to do with spiritual? It better be the right message. And any false message does not qualify as the milk that comes from God. Exactly. Unless we're telling the truth about God, we aren't giving the gospel. Because the gospel is the good news about God. So if we are no different in our behavior and in our actions from the world around us, how can we expect to be an example to them? So how do we as Christians truly become different? I mean, you know, you talk to teenagers, they don't want to be different. So at what point do we decide, yes, we want to be different? Well, we have different motivations. Okay. Um, we'll probably talk about this in the next lesson, but there's, when you take a word like equality, that everybody, how can you disagree with equality? But mm. Others have taken it like the Communist Manifesto and the uh, French Revolution as rallying cries, mm -hmm. and they use force to implement that. Whereas in the Christian, in, in God's kingdom, you, we don't force that. Yeah. We, we persuade, we encourage, we manifest. But and we recognize, it. along with that, we recognize, as Paul suggests in, in 1 Corinthians 12, that we're not all going to have the same gifts. We're not, we're not doing the cookie cutter thing here. Each person has his own particular abilities to contribute to. I mean, he, ta you know, he talks about the eyes and the ears and the hands and the feet and the nose. And each one of us can have our own individuality and still be contributing to the, the good of the total organization. One of the places, yeah. So being different is not to copy everybody? Is that? Well, one of the things, how, see, being, the, the, the idea from, from 1 Corinthians 12 is we collectively, as a church, are moving forward. We're, we're, we're collectively moving forward as a church. But that moving forward as a church is obviously intended me to mean that we are different than the world. We're not supposed to be different than other church members, hopefully, but different than the world. Okay. Hebrews 4.12 is one of the places they suggest we look at in that reference. The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts all the way through to where soul and spirit meet, to where joints and marrow come together. It judges the desires and thoughts of the heart. So what does that have to do with being spiritual and drinking the milk and so forth? Well, again, the Word of God 
is that sword that he's talking about that cuts. And what does it cut? It cuts truth from falsehood. Exactly. Exactly. Well, it's it separates soul and spirit. You yeah. know, what you do from what it was motivating to you to do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, it goes to the heart of the problem. Wh why did you do this? So it's not just a matter of not being doing yeah. the things that others do it's it's why you're doing those what's the motivation what's yeah. the force behind it, them? It, it is it is by studying and meditating on the word of god and discovering the truth about his character and his government as described in the bible that we learn to love and serve him in the best possible way and the famous quotation that we have used many times but i will i have to come back to it surrounded as we are with people living immoral greedy, evil lives, how are we supposed to be transformed? And this is the answer from, this is from Ellen White, the basic same idea is given in scripture. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. So if we're spending our whole time watching TV, watching movies, What's happening to us? It's not a question, well, I choose to be like this thing that I spend five minutes on in the morning, but I don't want to be like the rest of the stuff I fill my mind with all day long. Uh, it doesn't work like that. It becomes, the mind becomes assimilated that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. If it's me, 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 then you know where we're going. Uh, he, rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. Well, so Peter next wants to talk about something very interesting that's linked all the way back to the Old Testament. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to read verses 4 to 8. Come to the Lord, the living stone, rejected by people as worthless, but chosen by God as valuable. Come as living stones and let yourselves be used in building the spiritual temple where you will serve as holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. For the scripture says, I chose a valuable stone which I am placing as a cornerstone in Zion and whoever believes in him will never be disappointed. This stone is of great value for you that believe, for the, but for those who do not believe, and now he quotes again from Psalms, the stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. And another scripture says, this is a stone that will make people stumble, the rock that will make them fall. They stumbled because they did not believe in the word, such was God's will for them. So what's the story behind that? Well, we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some more things, and then we'll, we'll read Ellen White's summary of what that's all about. Where do you suppose Peter got those words <laughs> from? Do you think that uh, he, he learned those in school? Did he ever memorize those words in Hebrew? Well, they're from several places in the Old yeah. Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah, several different places. Isaiah 28, Psalms 118, Isaiah 8. I think, I think the Jews would have considered those words pretty important. They probably, I don't know, we have verses we ask children to memorize these days. I think Peter might have memorized them back in his day. He probably but, memorized all of Scripture also. That's possible. But remember that, and, and we need to remember this, they, Peter and John, when they stood up before the Sanhedrin, were considered to be uneducated. So... Uh, whatever that means. Um, having spent years with Jesus, he recognized the true application of those verses. In fact, Jesus himself used Psalm 118, 22. Just look at that. We just, basic part of what we just quoted. The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. And what, what was the context in which Jesus said that? Well, Matthew 22, 40, 21, 42. You remember he's talking about the 
the men who the man who went away and let out his ten, his, his vineyard to some tenants and they were terrible and they did all they killed everyone who came to talk to them and what did Jesus say and very interesting because now when the owner of the vineyard comes what will he do to those tenants Jesus asked and who's he asking to answer the Sanhedrin basically and what did they say? He will certainly kill those evil men, they answered, and let the vineyard out to other tenants who will give him his share of the harvest at the right time. And what do you suppose, how long do you suppose it took them to figure out they were condemning themselves? Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read what the scriptures say? The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. And Maybe Peter and John and the other disciples might not have memorized the Old Testament, but the people in the Sanhedrin surely should have. Paul certainly did. And Paul certainly did. Well, uh, and uh, let me just mention that in the context. So remember when Peter and John were arrested and told absolutely not to speak about Jesus ever again after they had performed that miracle, and they were put in prison, and the Next morning, the Sanhedrin goes and looks for him, and the prison is empty. Where are these two guys? They're over there standing in the temple preaching. And so they arrested them and took them before them, and they said, didn't we tell you not that you never spoke, speak in the name of Jesus ever again? And so Peter stands up, and you remember those famous words. Uh, I'm going to start from verse 10. Then you should all know, and all the people of Israel should know, that this man stands here before you, the one that had been healed, completely well through the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from death. Jesus is the one of whom the scripture says, the stone that you builders despised turned out to be the most important of all. Salvation is to be found through him alone in all the world. There is no one else whom God has given who can save us. I mean, it, I mean it's like... You know, at the end of some football games, they pour a bucket full of ice on, I mean, the Sanhedrin, I mean, they, they must have just stopped breathing about that point in time. I mean, just. So what is a living stone? Now, we know about putting stones and even bricks into buildings, but what's a living stone? A well, stone is part of the, the whole building. So he's likening to, and we're likened to be uh, God's, a dwelling place for God. God, okay. God will be, dwell with us and be in us. And so there's that analogy, you know, the living, st we're living mm -hmm. stones, not just a. Just as the building, whether it's timbers or whether it's bricks or whether it's stones are used to build up the church, the, the living church would be members who are, living like Jesus, who are witnessing, who are studying their Bibles and so forth. Um, so this is not mortar and bricks we're talking about here. This is people who are witnessing for the truth, right? So these living stones are not supposed to be just sitting around. Okay, now I joined the church. Ah, you know, and you know, We've said this before, and I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to say it again, but I think we have to. If you haven't done anything in the church, if, you ha if your knowledge of God hasn't advanced at all in the last year, you're probably worshiping an idol. Mm -hmm. A false concept of God. Yeah. Or at least an inadequate one. You might have, maybe you had a little bit of the milk, but you've got to keep growing. We're talking about the infinite one. Mm -hmm. and that means with, means without limit, uh, we, should, or we should be constantly expanding our understanding of the infinite one. When we are baptized, a lot of people sort of forget this. When we are baptized, we're not just baptized supposedly into the household of God. We're also baptized into a local community. Our names are registered as a part of a local group. And so we should work toward the benefit of not only God's kingdom, but we should also work toward the benefit of our local community, our local church group that we are a part of. Is that one of the responsibilities that we should be uh, taking upon ourselves? 
Well, of all the things that God sort of asks us to do, what do you think we're the poorest at? I mean, I shouldn't even ask that question, huh? Does God ask us to do, or does he ask us to understand? Okay. Which comes first? Yeah, the yeah. doing or the understanding? And it would have to be the understanding. How can you, how can you go out and witness, for example? How could, what's the purpose of reading the Bible if you don't get any understanding? See, yeah. Yeah. Through the Old Testament, he's, God says, you don't listen. Mm -hmm. you, you don't, it, he's complaining about them not listening. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't learn anything if you're not listening. Mm -hmm. You can't give what you don't have. Yeah, that's right. So, Absolutely. God is the giver of all good, good gifts, so he's the one we go to to get them from, and then we give them to, to others. Yeah. That passage in 1 Peter we read a little while ago says, Going on now, this would be verse 5, 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Uh, we are supposed to be living stones, that is, we, us, are supposed to be holy priests, offering spiritual and acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. What yeah, would that be? I think we need to emphasize in verse 6 that the last statement in that verse says that... Um, uh, you're uh, uh, talking about the stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and that's Jesus, and the one who trusts in him. The word here is really a word that has to do with persuasion mm -hmm. as opposed to trusting. We need to be persuaded that what Jesus brought is something that is important to us because we understand what the content of that message was. Then it goes on to say, and you will never be put to shame. In reality here, the Greek makes it quite clear that it is a matter of you'll never be confused. Mm -hmm. So if you, it's more than trusting, it's really being persuaded mm -hmm. of a message and if you understand it, you'll never be confused. And that's particularly important in our day because what do we know is coming? The devil himself is eventually going to appear in person. Yes. And before him is going to come a whole array of other people and probably devils appearing like human beings with all sorts of confusing arguments. And boy, we better, we better be aware of what the Bible says or we're going to be carried away. Well, another word for a persuasion would be uh, convinced. Mm -hmm. you know, it's all a process, and it takes, it's a process, really. You can't just, oh, I got faith. The Lord gave me faith. I remember uh, the, a famous uh, uh, preacher type uh, years ago. I went to a place on a, on a Sunday morning to a, an Easter service because I thought maybe I learned something about what their concept about uh, the cross. Anyway. The whole sermon was, oh, you got to have faith, got to have faith. I can't give you any evidence for it, but you got to have faith. It was a total, total waste of time. Yeah. You, you, most of you know who the, I'm referring to, but I won't put it <laughs> on the air. Okay. Well, when you, when you talk about understanding and, and figuring and being persuaded, can you put that on a timeline? Well, I would like to put, uh, put it on a timeline, yeah. It, it starts now and it lasts forever. Yeah, I know, but um, if... If you're starting to ask us, why aren't we doing everything that God wants us to do? What if it's just because we don't understand it yet? Mm -hmm. It is. And, um, and so if you don't understand it yet, well, that's the timeline I'm thinking of. If, if you're criticizing people because you're not doing what God says, how do you know if you've reached that point yet that you can actually do what God says? That's a very good question, and, and the answer should be, let's get with it. Let's get see. It? Let's yeah, but still, you can't well, speed up the timeline well, when you don't have end well, points. You can give with you what you have, you yeah. know, whatever it is. Some, and, you know, a cup of cold water, you know, is the proverbial yeah. one in Ellen White's writing. So, because obviously you could delay that until you think you know God fully, which is, of course, as Jim would say over here, the infinite one. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think you would be delaying anything. I'm just, my question is, yeah. when do you come to the understanding that you'll start doing the right things? And well, how can you, you put that on God a timeline? Is, yeah. well, what if you know what God has done for you? That's, you know, like the demoniacs. Go back and tell people mm -hmm. what great things God has done for you. They had very limited understanding of who Jesus was and mm -hmm. 
what he was going to do. But, but it was enough so that when Jesus came back to that area, the whole community wanted to, wanted to hear him. Yeah. Thousands of them went out to hear him. Also, we have to remember that Jesus on the cross said, forgive them for they know not. Mm -hmm. What he was really saying, forgive them for they don't understand yet. Yeah. They don't have the correct knowledge. That doesn't mean that we will always be forgiven because we don't know, because at some point we're supposed to know. Yeah. Yeah. When would that will be in your timeline? I don't know, but I don't think we're there yet. Well, Peter goes on shortly and talks about this covenant relationship. And if we go back in the Old Testament, we see there was that covenant relationship between Abraham and God. We've already talked about what, what, what the result was of that. It, it, later it talks about in Genesis 31, 44, it talks about a covenant relationship between Laban and Jacob. Uh, there in, in 1 Kings 5, it talks about a covenant relationship between Solomon and Hiram to build the temple. Uh, later on, David has a covenant relationship with the elders in Israel, 2 Samuel 5, or actually it was earlier. Uh, what are these covenant relationships? What does it mean to have a covenant relationship? You made a deal. You made a deal, okay. Is that what you would like, um, Is, Myra, come, come to, it, to make a deal? And then you've got a contract. Yeah. Because a deal may be something. The exchange is something. Yeah. Perhaps. Unfortunately, uh, to make a deal often implies that you take advantage of your Exactly, or somebody's other person. being taken advantage of. Yeah. Well, it certainly contract. wasn't. What? It's a contract. It's yeah, but, but legally it's, it's a contract. It's an agreement. It's an understanding. Um, and Abraham was supposed to pass that along to all his descendants and God renewed that covenant with Isaac, and then he renewed that covenant with Jacob or Israel. Well, how do, how do we get into that? How do we get into that relationship? Well, we're not, we're not Jews. It's a promise, isn't it? Isn't the covenant yeah. a promise? Yeah, that's a part of it. You get into it by believing the promise. Okay. We're grafted in. Yeah. Grafted in. We already read that, didn't we? Yeah, about the true. grafting in. And what did Paul say? Do you remember what Paul said? If you are a member of the church, the Christian church, you are a descendant of Abraham, didn't he? Well, <clears throat> how, how, do you, how do you put that together? How can you say that real quick? Well, I mean, you want to hear Paul's words? I can read them to you. No, no, no. Just in, what, in what does that mean? I summarize, summarize how we are. Well, Paul's, Peter and Peter. Paul basically are saying the Jewish people failed to do what God asked them to do when he made the covenant with them. Now it's your turn. Let's see how good you're going to do. So if they hadn't have failed, then we wouldn't have had to do it. Well, hopefully if they had, well, their job was to spread the gospel to the whole world, and they would have, we would have got, received the gospel by their doing it properly. They then didn't. We would have got the covenant then, too. Mm -hmm. Now we Everybody has got it. That would be perfect. That's exactly <laughs> what God wanted when he made the covenant back in the beginning, but it didn't work out. Mm. Well, Paul said, since you sort of asked me about that, Galatians 3.29, if you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. I don't know how you can say it clearer than that. Because you believe in him like uh, Abraham believed in God, that he mm. was going to do what God said he was going to do. If, mm. When you believe in Jesus, you're basically doing the same thing that Abraham did. But as we said earlier, these promises of God are not unconditional. And I'm quote, quoting now from volume 2 of the Testimonies, page 574. The Lord covenanted, that's promised or agreed or so forth, that if they were faithful in the observance of his requirements, he would bless them in all their increase and in all the work of their hands. You would have thought that would be a pretty desirable state of things. Um, going on, here's another one. This is from our Bible study guide. See what you think of this. Indeed, the prophets repeatedly warned Israel of the dangers of disobedient to, disobedience to God's law, often using language reminiscent of the covenant. It has been argued that with the possible exception of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, many prophecies in the Bible are conditional. That's how central the idea of obedience is in regard to the covenant promises. The covenantal prom prophecies of blessing 
were conditional on obedience to God's law, and prophecies of doom applied only to the disobedient. So, does that mean that God promised you something It only works if you're obedient? Nobody well, sure? Well, there's, there's probably no end to the promise, so no matter how deep you get, there's a possibility you mm -hmm. could get back up if you believed in the promise sometime. Okay. Well, I think that we should define obedience to what? Yes. Chances are we're talking about obedience to commandments. That would be righteousness by works. Mm -hmm. Obedience if to... If it's our efforts to obey. Exactly. Yes. If it, it is obedience to the principle of love, universal, unconditional love, then we do what the commandments say, not because the commandments are telling us to do it, but because the principle of love mm -hmm. is in our heart, and therefore we do what the commandments say. So obedience to what? And I think this is where we get confused too much of the time. We insist on the commandments, righteousness by works, instead of recognizing that it's a submission, mm -hmm. in that to sense, Islam, which means submission to, we too also should be sub we should submit not to a God, but to the principle of love that this God has brought us. Mm -hmm. Well, I mentioned earlier that God had made a covenant with the children of Israel. And said, oh, whatever you say, here's the passage, Exodus 19. I don't have time to read all the way from chapter, from verse, verse 4 all the way to verse 8, but it says, I'm going to read verse 8. Then all the people answered together, We will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. Well, you got the same problem in Joshua chapter 1. Yeah. All that you have commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Mm -hmm. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only so, may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment, and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Sure. Only be strong and of good courage. I mean, this is, I mean, how, that's a level okay. of the understanding of those here's, people. Here's, here's my question, and this is a serious question, although it may not sound like a serious question. The, the angels around the throne of God, when they heard these two promises from the people, did they laugh or did they cry? I think they cried. Mm, definitely. Very, very sad. I mean, the cho and and did the children of Israel? Do you think they said this because they? Don't you think they meant it when they said it? Sure, sure they did. Yeah. But again, we have in those translations, like in 19:5, when we say, "Now, if you obey me fully, then I'll do something for you." Mm -hmm. Obey what? Mm -hmm commandments or that principle of love. Mm -hmm. They always went to the commandments mm -hmm. instead of the principle of love that would cause them to do what the commandments say. Yeah. And if they'll obey, it really means a willingness to listen or, and take instruction. It makes a little more sense. And, and, and the Hebrew is more like, if you listen to my voice, yeah. then yeah. you will be Well, special. you go back to Exodus 6.6 6 and following, where it says, I'll take you out uh, your, the land at which I promised your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he goes on, but they didn't listen right. because of their cruel conditions that they were living in. But they didn't listen. That's all through the Old Testament, God complains, you're not listening. God, the gave, them, God. God gave them 1,400 years, basically, from the time of Moses to the time of Jesus. And then he said, that's enough. He has given the Christian church 2,000 years now. And what are we doing? Still not listening. You know, when, the, when you said that the angels cried when they made that promise, how do you know that? That's what I, I, I said, I, actually. I, what I said, the, he said that, but I didn't. But no, I, I would. No, you said it first. Well, I agreed with you. He asked the question. He asked I asked the question. question. But I asked the question. You did asked they, the question? Did they laugh or did they cry? And he said they, he thinks they cried. I think they said, now they're talking. <laughs> no. Yeah, well, knew, how do you know? They, because they everybody's knew, learning. They, they knew what these guys had been like be in the past. Mm -hmm. they, well, I don't know. After being in the high place, in the, in the uh, going up to the mountain of God, that's a different thing that's ever happened before. 
So maybe they said, yes, now we're talking. But dazzling with changed, brilliance huh? doesn't have, have much stay in power. Yeah. You, 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 well, we, we can say that after all this has nature. happened, <laughs> but, but after they made that promise, how are you going to predict what's going to happen? I, I think the angels would have been hopeful. I think they might have been hopeful as they were crying. <laughs> Technically, the two groups. I don't know. I don't same, like though. angels that cry for some first, reason. I just group, don't like that. <laughs> the first group died in the wilderness, yeah. and the second group was their children. Maybe they were more compliant with following after Moses. Well, Hebrews well, doesn't give not. us a lot of encouragement there. <laughs> okay. Well, they now, to go in. what does it mean to be a royal priesthood? That's that's the that's the passage, the, the representation all the way from the Old Testament now into Peter. A, a chosen nation, a royal priesthood, what does that mean? Well, in the Syriac, it's in the Old Testament, it clearly says that you will be kings and you will be priests. Now, how can you be both at the same time? If you are a priest, you understand the principle of God's love, if you understand that. Nobody will ever attack you if everybody believes that. How can you be harmed by anyone? Mm -hmm. Therefore, we do what we want to do, and we are kings, because all we do is to reflect the love of God in all that we do. Yeah. Well, in the Old Testament, what did the priests do? They ministered to God and, and to the people. We always think about, because the, most of the passages in Scripture talk about what they did at the temple. But clearly, most of the year, most of them were not at the temple. They were in the 48 cities that had been assigned to the tribe of Levi, scattered around. What did they do there? They did not offer sacrifices at those places. They did not. They were not allowed to offer sacrifices. So, so what did they do? They had synagogues where okay. they learned. The synagogues came along quite a bit later, but that's, yeah, later they did. And, and what happened in the synagogue? They learned. On the, on the Sabbath, there was a, obviously a, a service there. But during the week, it was a school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for boys. Unfortunately, Myra, I'm sorry, not for girls. It was a, it was a cool. But some of those That's girls. That's the problem, isn't it? That's why they couldn't make it. I, well, <laughs> no, I have a little problem with that because of Mary. Yeah. Who taught Jesus? She she obviously got her education. Yeah. And and how we don't know. Yeah, but Mary was not the only one who taught Jesus. And somehow no. I think that, somehow but I think, yeah. She had to give him that learning experience, that, that desire to learn. Yeah. Amen to that. Mary was probably a little bit special. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you know, how, many, how many kids had come back from school and the, the, the girls' sisters come up and say, what did you learn today? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Oh, I'm sure. I think that probably well, happened a lot. Yeah. And how many teachers at at the synagogue or uh, came home and taught their family. Yeah. The whole family. Yeah. The whole right. family. The girls too. L let's not Sorry, think for... Sorry, you have to memorize as well as the boys. Let's not think for one minute that humans were the only ones who taught Jesus. Yeah. Isaiah 50 yeah. is pretty clear about that. Uh, Ellen White says specifically that when Jesus would go out early in the morning to pray and so forth, he was taught by the angels. He was sometimes taught by God himself. I was Isaiah 50. referring to less than 12 yeah. <laughs> years of age. Well, <clears throat> have you ever known anyone whose Christian experience so stood out that everyone around recognized it? I would say that in my life I've had a couple, three people that mm -hmm. have stood out, but not in the way that Christ did. First Peter 2, 9, moving on to, down to our verses here. How can we in our day, quote, proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light? So now, of course, you're going to have to say, what was the darkness and what was the light? Hmm? And obviously it didn't happen in the Old Testament, did it? The utility of our old ways, our sinful habits, our way of thinking about uh, things, you know, me first. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a way that seems right to the man, a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So yeah. those are all dark 
areas of darkness. And I think about the children of Israel again, not that I want to, I mean, I don't, I don't think we are doing a whole lot better than they did, but if you read 2 Kings 17, what happened to the northern kingdom, and you read 2 Chronicles um, 36, especially 34, 35, and 36, and it says specifically that the, the northern tribe, and especially the southern tribe, the one that we know more about, was more wicked than the nations they drove out from before them. How could that happen? Satan worked hard. Satan worked hard. Well, more than that, they failed to understand that you listen to God. You don't just try to do what he tells you to do. If you don't understand God, you've got a problem. Yeah. Well, there's a point of rebellion where it just everything snaps the other way. Mm -hmm. So it may not be that they just kind of got there. It's just, they may have tried. Well, the way I look at the Old Testament, we have a situation where the priests were speaking, were listening to the prophets, mm -hmm. but did not always represent correctly what the prophets were telling them. So the people were res receiving a false message, mm -hmm. as we know from Scripture, that was true. Was that uh, on purpose, do you think, or just... That I think uh, some of it on purpose, and listen to Jesus, who uh, towards the end of his ministry is literally saying to the priesthood, it's yeah. all your fault. <laughs> yeah. Not only have you taken away the key, but you don't have the key yourself to enter the kingdom of God. Yeah. Well, are you proud to be a part of God's family? Yeah. As long as we learn. God recognizes that, especially in our day, near the final events of this world's history, Christians must stand out. There's no way that the, the, the gospel can be finished if Christians are undistinguishable from the world around them. It's just not going to happen. So, what do we do? Why do you suppose that one of the, the core, one of the core messages in our, supposedly our special message to the world, the three angels message, the one right in the middle says, come out of her, my people. And Revelation 18 expounds on that. Ellen White says, the church is very precious in God's sight. He values it not for its external advantages, but for the sincere piety which dis distinguishes it from the world. He estimates, that, he estimates that according to the growth of the members in the knowledge of Christ, according to their progress and spiritual experience. In other words, the, God looks at the church and he says, how well are they doing at learning and understanding how to be more like me? Christ hungers to receive from his vineyard the fruit of holiness and unselfishness. He looks for the principles of love and goodness. Not all the beauty of art can bear comparison with the beauty of temper and character to be revealed in those who are Christ's representatives. It is the atmosphere of grace which surrounds the soul of the believer, the Holy Spirit working upon mind and heart, that makes him a savor of life unto life and enables God to bless his work, Christ's Object Lessons, 298, paragraph 1 and 2. And that's really an expansion on what Moses wrote way back in Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 to 8. And I quote, I have taught you all the laws as the Lord my God told me to do. Obey them in the land that you are about to invade and occupy. Obey them faithfully, and this will show the people of other nations how wise you are. So what did they manage to do? They managed to show the other nations how foolish they were. When they hear of all these laws, they will say what wisdom and understanding this great nation has. No other nation, no matter how great, has a God who is so near when they need him as the Lord our God is to us. He answers us whenever we call for help. No other nation, no matter how great, has laws so just as those that I have taught you today. Okay, do I need to ask, do I, is it fair for me to ask the question now? Could those words describe the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 2017? You know, this is where we appreciate Desmond Doss. That mm -hmm. film that was just produced is a story of his life 
where he went by what the scripture said. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not kill, and he wasn't going to use a weapon, no matter what. And he was going to serve his enemies as much as his own people. <laughs> if you if you read, I, I, I got a, there's a, they produced a small abridged version of the book, and I read it through. And he said, as far as he could remember, the only time he actually carried a weapon was one time when somebody says, I'm wounded, but would you bring me my gun? <laughs> <It's> a, okay. <laughs> I think he used it one as a slint, too, or something. That's else. right. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. true also. Yeah. Well, when the people in our community, and yours out there, when they look at us, do they see something different? Do they see something that attracts them? <clears throat> Not always. People don't always appreciate love. Mm -hmm. And proof of that is Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. What did they do with him? Yeah. So perhaps we are mistaken if we think that whatever our religion mm -hmm. is, it should produce this uh, amazing feeling among others that we are special. Yeah. Oftentimes the opposite is true. Yeah. But the, the disciples, they all thought they were the best. Well, it did seems they? like there's a... There was a, always a question, you know, who's the greatest? And it is with uh, churches, too, I think. Well, what would Jesus do if he were in our, living in our world today? Same thing he did back then. Exactly. <laughs> he would see. How would he be received? That's Not necessarily any that. better. Yeah. <laughs> Which church leaders would he criticize? <laughs> Now, we better not get too specific here. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it depends if a church leader would want to kill him, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, he was after them because they were trying to do him in. Why did Jesus find it necessary the last week of his life at church headquarters saying, I am the rejected stone? We've already read about it. What? He had he had been rejected. Yeah. Well, the Apostle John, many years later, picked up this idea in in Revelation. Look at what he says in Revelation, this same same passage, Revelation one verse six, for example. And made us a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To Jesus Christ be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Are we a kingdom of priests? And that's not the only place he said it. You go to chapter 5, verse 10, still in Revelation. You have made them a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they shall rule the, on earth. Now, that sounds more like king than priest, doesn't it? Well, what, What's the metaphor in that, being a priest? Well, that's what I tried to ask you earlier, and you didn't help me very much. Well, you didn't ask it that way. <laughs> okay. But... But um, we all are to be representatives mm -hmm. of God yeah. in our own way. Uh, the whole universe, probably the influence of God gets spread out from all of us being the representative of God. Well, if, if you go on to Revelation 20, verse 6, it says this, Happy and greatly blessed are those who are included in this first raising of the dead. The second death has no power over them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they will rule with Him for a thousand years. What time period is that talking about? Millennium. Mm -hmm. The millennium. Now, we, if, if I were to ask you, with forgetting about this verse for a moment, in the Old Testament, what did the priest do? Most of you would sooner or later get the place where he's cutting the throats of lambs and he's chopping them up and that's not going to happen in heaven. But that doesn't mean it was supposed to happen on earth either. Well. And there's a possibility that that was not their job. Their job was to represent the words given to them by the prophets. Mm -hmm. And instead of doing that, they tried to sell salvation. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus ended up calling this place a den of thieves. Mm -hmm. They were stealing money in supposedly to offer salvation. Stealing, stealing money basically so they could buy the privilege from the Roman government to be high priests the next year. Exactly. Well, 
we've talked about the spiritual milk now for a while in various ways, and um, I see where our time is really running up. Ephesians 4, uh, verses 11 to 16, and Hebrews 5, 11 to 6, 3, talk about growing up. So what's the purpose of drinking all that milk? Doesn't it make us grow? It does, but we better not stay at the level of the milk. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you could ask an angel going by, you know, if you could just stop one, you could see him, you could stop him and say, tell me how I'm doing. What do you think they would say today to most Christians? Are you still drinking milk? <laughs> <laughs> Are you interested in the solid food? Exactly. In quoting the prophecy of the rejected stone, Christ referred to an actual occurrence. These are the words of Ellen White um, in the history of Israel. The incident was connected with the building of the first temple. While it had a special application at the time of Christ's first advent and should have appealed with special force to the Jews, it has also a lesson for us. When the temple of Solomon was erected, the immense stones for the walls and the foundation were entirely prepared at the quarry. This just blows my mind. I mean, what kind of measuring instruments did they have? If you go there to Jerusalem today and you look at some of those stones, you go way down as, as deep as you can go, that tunnel that goes along the wall, you, you see that those, those stones fit together just, I mean, you can't put a piece of paper in there. How did they do that hundreds of, I don't know, many miles away anyway? Anyway, they were brought to the to place a building, not an instrument was to be used upon them. The workmen had only placed to place them in position. For use in the foundation, one stone of unusual size and peculiar shape had been brought, but the workmen could not find could find no place for it and would not accept it. It was an annoyance to them as it lay unused in, in, in their way and so forth. And I want to get to the bottom of this. Should they, so they, here's a stone had been sitting around in the way. Should they uh, make an unwise choice for this important place? The safety of the entire building would be endangered. They must find a stone capable of resisting the influence of the sun, the frost, the tempest, and so forth. And they took that stone that had been sitting out there, and they brought it to the place, and lo and behold, it fit perfectly. It was exactly the right stone for what they needed. So in prophetic vision, Isaiah was shown that this stone was a symbol of Christ. Our kind and loving Father, we want to be living stones in your temple. We need to understand more thoroughly and more completely how we can be the kind of witnesses that you were, how we can be, how we can live lives in our day that were more and more like you. May that be our experience from our time together as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.